And so I think overall what we're going to end up finding is that blood pressure is responsible for a lot of diseases in a number of different ways that we probably didn't understand even until 2018. Welcome to the Stroke Cast. A Generation X stroke survivor explores rehab, recovery, the frontiers of neuroscience, and how to peel a banana with one hand. Hello, I'm Bill Monroe, and welcome to episode 47 of the Stroke Cast. When I had my stroke back at age 46, it took a little while for the medical team to settle on the cause. They checked a whole bunch of stuff. They looked at my history. They gave my heart an ultrasound. And good news, it wasn't pregnant, but they did find a PFO. And I suppose it's a good thing it took them time. We don't want them to rush to a conclusion. But ultimately, they did come to a conclusion that the probable cause was a history of high blood pressure. And that didn't make any sense to me at the time. Because at the time of the stroke, my blood pressure was normal. Now, I did have a history. In 2015, I developed high blood pressure or hypertension over the course of a year, but I didn't even know about it. You see, that's the thing about high blood pressure. It doesn't hurt. There was no pain. There was no way to know that my blood pressure had been steadily creeping upwards over the course of a year or doing damage all along the way. I mean, as I said, there was no pain. The only reason I found out was that because the last week of December in 2015, I began having massive 30-minute pouring nosebleeds every other day. Uh, eventually, I used my girlfriend's home blood pressure machine to test my BP, and it registered at more than 200 over 160. That and the random surprise bleeding got me into the doctor's office. They measured my blood pressure at a much lower 162 over 102. So it had dropped, apparently, from ER levels by the time I got to the doctor's office. Over the course of the next few months, we worked to get my blood pressure under control through medication and, and some diet tweaks. And by March of 2016, just three months later, my blood pressure was coming in at 105 over 75. We continued to manage it over the course of the year. And by February of 2017, just over a year since those sky high numbers, it was down to a healthy 100 over 70. And I was feeling pretty good about that. And then four months later, on June 3rd, 2017, a clot formed in my right middle cerebral artery, broke my basal ganglia, and led to this whole adventure that you're joining me on today. I had serious high blood pressure for maybe a year to a year and a half tops. I had it under control for a year before my stroke. So how could high blood pressure have caused a stroke? This week... Dr. Nirav Shah, a neurologist at Swedish Medical Center in Seattle and the founder and CEO of Sentinel Healthcare, returns to StrokeCast to answer that very question as we talk about just how high blood pressure causes ischemic strokes. So welcome back, Nirav. Happy to have you back again. Thank you. Great uh, to be back. Now, one of the things we talked about uh, last time you were on about your work with Sentinel Healthcare and what you're doing there was about enabling remote monitoring of hypertension and blood pressure because it's so critical. And we know that hypertension, high blood pressure, is one of the main risk factors for stroke. Now, I think for most folks, it makes sense that high blood pressure could cause a hemorrhagic stroke. You start pumping blood too fast through those veins, something weak breaks, and you have a bleed. But it's also a high risk for ischemic strokes or a clot. And I don't know, my, my, my first thought would be that high blood pressure would actually prevent those because you got more pressure to punch a clot through. But so, so, so why, why does high blood pressure lead to ischemic strokes? Well, that's a great question. And it's not, it's not a very intuitive one. So to take a quick step back, hypertension has been known to be a problem for generations and potentially all the way back to the Greek era. Oh, wow. 
they were actually monitoring it, <laughs> looking at it back then? Well, not quite, but I think they had some sense that there was a disease of the arteries and the blood pressure, and they were starting to get at it, but they're a little bit off. But, you know, they were kind of on the right track. They kind of had some gestalt that mm-hmm. something about the pressure and the ethers of the blood. And the hu- the, they were, the they were talking a lot about humors and stuff. Humors and such. <laughs> and so in the modern era, we've learned that that high blood pressure can cause stroke, just as you said, it can cause bleeding stroke. It can cause an aneurysm to rupture, which typically causes what we call a subarachnoid hemorrhage. So as opposed to blood rupturing and bleeding inside of the brain tissue, a subarachnoid is bleeding around the brain tissue, which is beneath the arachnoid there, which is this tissue layer that kind of protects the brain. So that's why it's called subarachnoids in between those two layers. And, and that tissue layer, it kind of looks like spider webs? Exactly. Yep, yep. It looks like spider webs. And then there's the question that you just asked, which is, why would high blood pressure cause stroke due to lack of blood flow? Because that's counterintuitive. And so the reason is, it is indeed counterintuitive. And it kind of takes us back through the history of stroke and how we've gotten here. And we're only a few generations into stroke care. The father, most people would say, of stroke care is C. Miller Fisher, who a half century ago started doing autopsies. He was a pathologist in Boston, and he started assessing the the brain by cutting it apart carefully. And up up until then, no one had really thought to look at the arteries. People were just looking at the brain tissue. And so when he looked at the arteries, specifically small arteries, what we now call the basal ganglia or small vessel territories, technically, he found that there were many areas that were thicker. Uh, He ended up calling it lipohyalinosis. And we'll post some notes, you know, and articles to the show notes. And so he, he kind of documented this was a problem. He called it arterial disorganization, fibrinoid degeneration, and lipohyalinosis, which basically meant that it was thicker. It was thicker and more prone to getting clogged. And over time, what we found is that high blood pressure and other things like diabetes and smoking will disease the small arteries to the point where they become stiffer from the constant pressure that they have to deal with. And the response is to get stronger and stiffer and thicker or lipohyalinotic to the point that they can shut down. Kind of like how when we want to get stronger for lifting things, we do exercises that build up our muscles when the blood vessels have to do more work from containing blood at a higher pressure. They sort of build up the muscles that are part of the circulatory system or rather the walls of those. Exactly. Yeah, and that's exactly correct. And so diabetes can cause us due to the blood sugar effects Smoking can cause it due to the inflammation, and high blood pressure, it's thought, causes it just due to that pulsating effect. And so in his detailed kind of analysis and autopsies, which we don't do as much anymore because we have MRI technology, Mm -hmm. he kind of demonstrated that at branch points where one artery would start to branch into two smaller arteries, there would be these accumulations of plaque or atheroma, which is another word for plaque. And those are the areas that he ended up calling lipohyalinosis and what we now know cause lacunar strokes. And he called them lacunar strokes because they were, they were like little lakes, lacoons. Interesting. So it's like that branching point where that stuff accumulates. It kind of, sounds like it's kind of like when even you just look at the, at the roads, you'll tend to see a lot more debris accumulate at intersections and at corners. This stuff just gets shoved aside where to, where things branch off. Yeah, yeah, that's a great point. Especially, for example, after snow, right? The, mm-hmm. the snow plow comes by and then pushes it off, and so it accumulates on corners. And so that area could get prone if it were small and this were, you know, it wasn't cleaned or in that case, you know, the snow doesn't melt. And so these lacunar areas are in places like the ponds, which is part of the brainstem, and the deeper areas of the brain, some people call them subcortical, and then technically people refer to the anatomy of these areas as basal ganglia. Mm-hmm. And so we now know that high blood pressure makes you prone to having stroke because of that pressure 
causing lipohyalinosis in those areas. Now, if we kind of look at bigger arteries, like the carotid arteries, we also know that the pressure in the artery can create what people refer to as a shear stress. And that at a branch point, plaque will accumulate there because the shearing stresses of the pulsating blood flow will eventually do the same thing and cause that bifurcation or that branch point to start getting thicker and collect plaque because of the inflammation that's being caused over time. Interesting. It, it, it's sort of like uh, also like the way your skin gets calloused at your hand when you constantly move over something again and again, you'll build up a callus or you build up a callus on the bottom of your foot. Exactly. Except instead of with skin, it's happening internally in the blood. Yeah, so. yeah. And so it's definitely thought to be a protective mechanism, right? Because if you had an artery uh, by genetics or just anatomical variation that was somehow prone to more shear stress, you'd want your body to be able to accommodate that and get tougher, like you just described. Exactly. Okay, very, very interesting. And then that becomes a problem over time. Especially if it's uncontrolled. And so what we now know is that, like all things, in moderation, it's probably <laughs> good to have a little bit of that. But then if it progresses for long, you add a little bit of diabetes, you add some smoking, you add some poor diet and other metabolic factors, then all of a sudden it can be a really devastating problem to call, cause these small vessel strokes. And unfortunately, these areas that we refer to as lacunar territories or small artery territories are areas where a lot of neurons cluster together. And so a stroke in these areas can be quite disabling because they can have a bunch of tracts that eventually cause weakness in the arms, leg, and face, or sensation loss in the face, arm, and legs, or other symptoms that are dense, meaning there's very low likelihood of recovery. So it's sort of like there's so much stuff going through there. It's, it's one thing if you take out the phone lines to a whole bunch of houses. If you take out the lines that are going through that very small switching station, you really take down an entire network. That's exactly true. Yeah, that's exactly a good way to think about it. And these are relay stations where these areas kind of cluster together just by design and luck. With that accumulation then of plaque, you've got this narrowing space and that lack of flexibility really makes it a lot harder for the body to deal with than a clot that gets stuck there. Yeah, 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 exactly. And so after a stroke, what we tend to do is let the blood pressure be high just because of the reasons you mentioned. It's what, one of the reasons why when I was in the neuro floor for uh, those first couple of days, they didn't want me elevating my head on the bed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we want the brain to get enough blood flow, um, and we also want the area that's potentially at risk to also have some extra blood flow while the body's healing and the brain's healing. And then long-term after stroke, we, we know that lowering the blood pressure is very likely to prevent future stroke. And as many of the people on this show probably know that the recurrence rate of stroke in the U.S. after our first stroke is about 8 to 9% in the first year. And so a big chunk of that is from high blood pressure not being controlled. Overall, 33% of all strokes are felt to be attributed solely to the blood pressure itself. Wow. Yeah, that's, that's quite substantial. And then, it, so w when we look at the, the blood pressure numbers, you know, we've got the systolic numbers and the diastolic numbers. So the top number, the, the faster one, that's, my understanding is that's the pressure when the heart is actually pushing it out, pushing the blood through. And then the second number is what it is when it's relaxing in between, in between beats, in between and giving everything a chance to release. And if your blood vessels are too stiff from this accumulation of, this plaque, this other material, then that may be one of those reasons why that lower number doesn't go down as much. That's correct. So when you're looking at that lower number, that's the one that sort of indicates that there's a potential, real, there's a real potential of risk here. Yeah, and, and that is a great point, Bill. So the bottom number we call the diastolic number represents how flexible your arteries are whereas the top number is how much pressure will go through through every beat. 
And so if the bottom number starts to rise, it can represent a number of things. It could be just part of aging. It could be from things like thyroid disease. But in this case, it could be because your arteries are stiffer from calcification, which is probably the most common. So smoking, diabetes, the things I keep mentioning over and over again are the things that will cause that bottom number to rise. And there was a time when we really focused on that number. Now we focus on it less so because both numbers are kind of problematic. And so we tend to tell people to focus on the top number, the systolic, which is the pressure itself from the heart pump. Over time of managing it and getting it down with, um, with medication, with those other things, does that actually remove some of those calluses or help clear away some of that junk in there? Or once you've got it in there, is, are you pretty much stuck with it? Well, I think to some degree, you're, you're probably stuck with the lipohyalinosis and the plaque accumulation. But lowering the blood pressure over time lets the body adjust again and it decreases the risk long-term. One of the, the studies that I'll share in the show notes with, with you guys is just a recent analysis looking at how important it is to start blood pressure lowering drugs in the first two days after a stroke or T, TIA, a transient ischemic attack. And not only does it reduce the rate of stroke, but what we're about to find is it's reducing the rate of cognitive decline or dementia in people who've had a stroke. And this is going to be probably one of the biggest things we'll find out about hypertension in the next few years. There's other evidence suggesting that lowering the blood pressure could prevent Alzheimer's and could prevent the conversion of memory issues to Alzheimer's. So for someone who's had a stroke or who's at risk of stroke, blood pressure is clearly the biggest thing that they can impact. And not only is it just because of preventing the outright stroke, but it prevents the memory loss from what people call vascular dementia. So that's phenomenal and important in and of itself, but it also may prevent regular dementia, meaning Alzheimer's. Why that is is unclear, but there's a recent study from Rush this summer where they did an autopsy of people who had blood pressure control versus those who didn't. And they found pretty big differences at the level of autopsy of amyloid plaque, which is what's responsible for Alzheimer's. And so I think overall what we're going to end up finding is that blood pressure is responsible for a lot of diseases in a number of different ways that we probably didn't understand even until 2018. Interesting. And a lot of the stuff that leads to high blood pressure also are conditions that lead to other things that we may be dealing with as well. We mentioned diabetes leading into that, which has, of course, its own other issues as well and controlling the, for those things. High blood pressure becomes a, is essentially becomes a symptom of a lot of other things in addition to being a cause for stroke and, and other conditions. That's correct. Well, this has, been, uh, this has been fascinating. What else do folks need to know about blood pressure? Well, I mean, I think the, the main thing is to not leave it untreated. So if you have high blood pressure, which is currently defined as greater than 130, the top number, millimeters of mercury, and you find out that you do have high blood pressure when you go to, let's say, a CVS, Target, Walgreens, Rite Aid, what have you, and check it on their machine or at a blood pressure screening, it's important to start getting treated sooner than later um, because you certainly don't want the cumulative risk of blood pressure causing stroke, heart attack, kidney problems, eye problems, and so on. Right, absolutely. And it's not a, it's not a fast thing, even if, uh, in my case, I had mine under control for a good six months. I was coming up with the normal things until, uh, until my stroke hit. It was just the accumulated damage over time that uh, just didn't get it controlled early enough to prevent this whole adventure. <laughs> So thank you very much. I think that's going to be really helpful and, and really help folks understand how that works and, and just why this is so important. Well, thank you. Great. Thanks for having me. And that brings us to our hack of the week, how to eat a steak at a restaurant. This may be one of the most inappropriate hacks I've ever put on the show, especially at the end of an episode all about controlling your blood pressure. But if your blood pressure is under control and your doctor's okay with it and you're not doing it every day, 
enjoying a nice tasty steak is probably not a problem. Everything in moderation, right? But one of the challenges with post-stroke life is that if you have only one functional hand, if you're dealing with hemiparesis, cutting that steak can be challenging. Because normally to cut a piece of meat, you got to put your fork in it with one hand and then use your knife with the other hand to start slicing off tasty, tasty meat. But when only one hand is working, that becomes a lot more difficult. Now, one option, of course, is just pick the thing up and start chowing down on it, Fred Flintstone style, or like you're eating a turkey leg at the state fair. And that can be a lot of fun. But especially in the fancier places, your dining companions might not appreciate that approach to uh, to steak consumption. The simpler and probably better way is that when you order your steak from the waitstaff, just say to them, hey, can you ask the kitchen to cut this up for me? And it's that simple. They've got really super big knives in the kitchen, and they'll be more than happy to do that for you. It takes them just a few seconds, and quite frankly, that's probably going to be the simplest meal customization any patron is going to ask them to do that night. And then when they bring that back to your table, you get to enjoy those nice, tasty steak pieces, and you can super easily t- and you can immediately tell if they cooked it just right. So go ahead and enjoy your meal. I always learn stuff when I meet with Narab. He he's he's always great to talk with. The main takeaway from this week though is of course control your blood pressure. If you don't know what it is, go ahead and find out and talk with your doctor to develop a plan to drive it to safe levels under 120 over 80. The benefits of keeping that blood pressure low and healthy are just incredible, and we're seeing more and more of those every day. Be sure to post a link to this episode to your Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, or Instagram accounts by using the link strokecast.com slash blood pressure to help others in your network understand the importance of controlling blood pressure and how it can help their lives today and decades into the future. If you'd like to hear more from Narav, be sure to check out his other appearances on this show by going to strokecast.com slash Nirav. And of course, as always, don't get best, get better. Thanks a lot. I'm Bill Monroe, and I'll talk to you next week. The Stroke Cast, Bill Monroe, and Bill's guests provide general information and entertainment, not medical advice. Please do not make any changes to your treatment plan or the execution of your treatment plan without first consulting your personal doctor or medical team. The Stroke Cast is a proud production of the Currently Speaking Podcast Network. Thank you.